Um, so as I was saying, I worked, I worked in cancer for, for 35 years, and when I got into the field, um, I mean, I learned that you know, cancer is not some foreign thing that comes in and takes over your body. Cancer is normal tissues that are maintaining themselves that progressively go wrong. And for the physicists in the crowd, you have to think about that when you think about cancer. It's not injecting something into an animal. It's normal tissues going wrong. And normal tissues have a defined structure you've heard about. There's cells, and most 95% of cancers are epithelial, lining tissue. These cells sit on a basement membrane here and move around from connective tissue. You can have high growth, high motility, but if it's ordered in space, that's normal. But you can get a, pro a, pro a progressive spectrum of change where you have growth, motility, without expansion of boundary, and you get piling up and compression, as you heard. And then when I went to medical school, I learned that the, before you get breaks in the basement membrane, it's basically benign. And if you see any hole in the basement membrane, it's now by definition malignant. And for many years, that was the prime definition of malignancy, because now it's free to invade and metastasize. So people thought of this as sort of this, and people still talk about it as sort of this static structure that is a host barrier to invasion. It's just sitting there, it's an extracellular wall. The fact is that all of your basement membranes are divided. I don't know what's happening, but I'm staying away from this. Not here. It's not here. you Oh, no. Wow. Wow. No, it's not you. It's nice to know it's not me. But just in case. I don't want to turn around. Okay. That, um, Essentially, all your basement membranes are turning over constantly. Molecules being clipped, molecules being added. Molecules being clipped, molecules being added. So I just keep that in mind. Okay. So now when I got involved in the 70s, at the same time that, that I learned about it, matrix and med school being this barrier, people were showing that changes in matrix turnover, synthesis and degradation, drove morphogenesis. The first step for that epithelium to form a bud in the embryo was the thinning of the basement membrane by increased degradation, and then the cells would respond by depositing more. And in med school, I, in med students, I say, matrix turnover is like, like glycogen growth. You have to clip an ad, clip an ad, a railroad locomotive puts out a track, then move, puts out a track, then move. So it has to clip to add new track. So these cells are degrading, but they're putting out more than they're synthesizing, so there's actually net extension of basement membrane, and this is coupled with growth, and the matrix change precedes the growth. It's not Cells growing and pushing. Okay, so this led me to realize as I began to read the literature that people find that the end stage of, of cancer is basement membrane breakdown. But you see changes and abnormalities in basement membrane and thinning in pre malignant conditions. So the question is could this actually be involved in driving cancer, changes in structure and physics and mechanics, and lead to disordered growth? So the other part is I thought that this might be mechanically controlled. And this kind of came a little out of nowhere, but I, I was studying development, and this is an embryo developing zebrafish, and you can see that in the early stages, it's like you might think cells divide. But then it hits a point where the cells start putting out matrix, forming cell-cell junctions, and applying traction forces that generate through actomycin in every cell, and they physically sculpt the, the different organs in the embryo. And so everything you hear about gene expression and signal transduction is happening in an incredibly mechanically active environment that varies spatially. And as I'm going to show you, mechanical forces regulate genes and signaling pathways. So we have to have that in the equation, and it's a great place for physicists to get involved and have to get involved. The other thing is when you take cells out of any tissue, they lose their shape, but if you put them on a rigid substrate, they, you either coat it with matrix or they deposit their own, they then adhere and pull and spread. You don't see the pulling on a rigid dish, but if you put them on a flexible substrate, they pull this into compression angles. This is true for not only muscle cells, but fibroblasts, epithelial, endothelial, lymphocytes, nerve cells, every cell does the same thing. So it was this sort of thinking that led me to propose 30 years ago that it's possible that this, if all the cells are creating tension, they're being resisted by other cells in the matrix. They're in a state of isometric tension or pre-stress. We know this is true because you cut a wound, the surgeons have to sew it together. So if it's pre-stress and you now have thinning, it's like a, a woman stocking with a run. That little run stretches out more than the rest. The red cells attached to it stretch, the ones next to it wouldn't, or they feel a change in force distribution.
distributions, tension, and that cell stretching or increased tension would lead to increased responsiveness to growth factors that are everywhere. And that would give you the differential growth that these cells respond and these don't, which is very hard to, to predict by a gradient when you're at a one cell diameter width. So the basic idea was matrix remodeling changes the mechanics. That, for example, increased flexibility promotes stretching. That tension on adhesion receptors that link the tension generating elements of the matrix and distortion of the cytoskeleton somehow big black box altered biochemistry. And this would give you localized growth, motility, and fractal like pattern. Now, in terms of cancer, the idea would be the same exact thing, except that instead of the matrix deposition being greater than synthesis, like here, and you get outgrowth, that it's just almost matching it for 15, 20 years. And so that you're getting these stimuli, but the cells are stimulated to grow, but the boundary isn't that you get it piled up. Now, we know from in vitro, if you have any stimulus for growth, there's always going to be some stochasticity, some lack of fidelity, and you can select that for anything you want, and you get spontaneous transformation. So if you could do this in vivo, you will lose, for example, that some cells, instead of dying when they detach, will survive, and now you increase the likelihood you get a positive feedback. So that was the idea. So I'm going to just briefly go at dying coffee-like speed. Um, so we've basically been able to show that cell distortion, in fact, does control cell functions. Uh, we developed the micro-contact patterning technique, which George Whiteside, you've heard about it years ago. I won't go into it, but in the sense physics hits biology, we use uh, microfabrication to make patterns, rubber stamps with self-assembling model layers of matrix molecules so that you have circles of different size surrounded by non-adhesive regions. Important point is, if you make big circles, cells stick, spread, and reach the non-adhesive regions that no longer resist pulling, and they stop and you get a pancake. A small island, you get a a golf ball on a tee. If you break this island up of matrix into as many small dots so that you have the same total matrix here and here, the cells spread like a suspension bridge from dot to dot because cells spread by pulling against these sites. And what we find with virtually every different anchorage dependent cell type is that as you increase island size and promote cell spreading, constant growth factors, we know the growth factors find their receptors, they signal the receptors, but these cells grow and with capillary cells here, they go into apoptosis, they die. I want to note, these cells are still adherent and they die. Now, if they completely detach, they die even more. But anoikis is detachment, but it's really shape, it's part of shape sensitivity. And there's actually different signaling involved. I'm going to the other part I'm going to just draw here is, uh, early on, Judah Folkman and Ken Penyon showed, if you do tumor cells that grow better, can grow in round, they still grow better if you have round and spread cells on a dish. Tumor, if normal looks like this in the graph there, tumor cells actually grow better when spread too. But they can grow even like that. And as they get more transformed, they look like this, and they look like this. And this is the increased population packing in a tissue, and then they, they go up the test. Yes? What is the definition of growth here? This, looks like this is cell cycle right? progression through S phase and division. So you will, you will see cells divide in that whole island and, and as well. We can, we can do that as well, but you actually, this was measuring G1S transition progression. Now, we can make other islands, and these were capillary cells, but we've done this with many cell types. You make thin islands that allow cell-cell interactions, you cause differentiation. So same growth factors, binding the same receptor signaling, you just spread to a moderate degree, you actually get differentiation. If you make square islands, you could literally cells show cells take the sh shape of their container by pulling against matrix. Now you give motility factors, and cells put out lamellipodia and filopodia, the actin projections, only in the corners. There's no bias on a circular cell. The important point is all the biologists will say, how do you regulate motility? Uh, small GPA's rack and all these signaling molecules. So it's all true. But both of these cells have all that activated, but the direction is governed physically. It's where the stresses are concentrated. And I can tell you about that in questions if you want to help us. Another interesting thing is you get more than one cell, and you get symmetry breaking. So for the physicist, this is a, you know close to your heart. If you have a constant matrix, no boundaries, cells move in a Brownian walk, smaller Brownian walk, you hit one point, a tipping point, and now you get collective behavior. And we've modeled this. I don't know if I have it here. Yeah, we've shown this with just two control parameters. If a cell touches another cell, it wants to move away. And if it has a high persistence time, it means it will keep moving, you get this behavior. 
if you have a cell that has low persistence, you don't get this. So we show this theoretically and experimentally. But it's a place where simple physics can come in. Important point, this is, this is the collective behavior you're asking about. Cells in vivo are groups. And we don't deal with that in signal transduction or analysis of chemistry genes and testing. So very simply, tissue patterning is governed by physical interaction between cells and matrix. Spatially controlled, you get normal fractal-like patterns you see in all species. You lose the, 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 the spatial control, you get disorganization. That's what we call a tumor. That's If you go and you look at a tree cut in half and you see this tumor-looking thing, it's a burl, it's a tumor. That is what a tumor is, tissue disorganization. Now, I'm not going to go into tensegrity today, but at the same time I started with this, uh, trying to understand how physical forces can impact cells. I presented this model of cells being built like our bodies. We're not water balloons. We have muscles and bones that crease to us. The tension determines stiffness and shape control and shape stability. And we've developed a physics and math that come in and we develop models that each is not not just mimicking results, but a priori predictions that cover many different cells. I'm not going to do that. What's important about tensegrity is it led us to say, before people discovered integrins, that the tenfold, we're built like tents, right? Ten pegs in the ground, you want to stick in the membrane, you put poles up, and you winch it in and put it under free stress. Where does the tent feel the forces? Through the connectors, through the pegs. So we predicted that the links between matrix and the cytoskeleton, which used to be called protein X at one point, uh, would be the key points to focus this. this. These are the integrins you've heard about. This is where they concentrate in like little Velcro spot welds and where the actomyosin attach. And so we then set out to show that to develop physics-based approaches to apply forces or engineering approaches to cells by, through specific receptors using magnetic particles coated with ligands for specific receptors. We could either twist or pull, apply controlled stresses, measures rotational torque or strain or, 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 or linear strain. And we could show that, in fact, if you pull on integrins, you pull through the whole side of the skeleton. If you pull on the bilayer, it's very flexible. Or other proteins in the bilayer, like growth factor receptors. And it just dissipates the stress locally. Now, Don mentioned the nucleus scaffold um, alluded to the side of the skeleton. And that is what links these integrins all the way to the nucleus, exactly like, as he said. But what's important is that, and he, he intimated this with his topoisomerase race and, and DNA polymerase, but most of the biochemical machinery of the cell that you hear about from the biologists, so DNA, most of the enzymes and substrates that negate DNA replication, RNA processing, transcription, translation by collisis, signal transduction, not floating in the lipid bilayer or in the cytosol. They function when immobilized on the insoluble scaffolds of the cytoskeleton and the nuclear matrix, which means that this is a place where deforming could actually in induce physical changes in molecular shape, which changes thermodynamic kinetics, which changes biochemistry. And in fact, using the same simple system, we've shown that pulling on integrins, but not other receptors, activates specific signaling pathways and gene transcription. Just a quickie that came out a couple of months ago. This is the fastest one I know of. This is pulling on beads on the left in a cell, and on the right is calcium imaging. This is calcium coming in, the little solar flare, five milliseconds after pulling on integrins in a stress-dependent manner through a channel called, I don't have it here, it's TRPD4. If you pull, and this is the focal adhesion, is this big. This is in the focal adhesion. If you pull on Another transmembrane receptor, you don't get this, so it's not the bilayer. And if you disconnect the, the basal, the, the internal portion, the cytoplasmic portion of the integrin, you don't get this. So it's integrin to focal adhesion to stretch activated ion channel. This is upstream of many of the signaling pathways that dominate cell biology and mechanobiology. Rho is downstream, uh, a lot of the protein kinases are downstream, cytoskeletal remodeling is downstream. And so this forces both focus through this integrins to this multi-molecular complex that is both a connector and it orients most of the signal transduction machinery in the cell. And pulling basically deforms molecules, opens them up, and you have new binding site, changes kinetics, changes ion channels, G proteins. The other thing, though, is it's kind of an amazing material from a material science standpoint. When you pull on the focal adhesion, it grows. When you dissipate tension, it, it, it disassembles.